رحم اللہ من قرع سورة الفاتحة بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ الذی قصرت ان رؤیته ابصار الناظرین وعجزت عن نعته اوہام الواسفین الحمد للہ رب العالمین الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبينا أبي القاسم محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين الذين ذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى وقوله الحق وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْقَاسِرِينَ صدق الله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته this is the second majlis in this series of majalis, which began last night. Last night's discussion, as I had mentioned, was tamheed, a muqaddama, a preface into the series of majalis that inshallah will continue until the suyam of Sayyidul Shuhada. For the second night in a row, I recited this verse, number 85, from chapter 3, Surah Ali Imran, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses by saying that whoever follows a religion other than Islam, it will not be accepted from him. And on the day of judgment, that person will be considered amongst the losers. This translation was provided last night as well, but left without explanation so that we can think about what could possibly be the explanation and the tafsir and the understanding of this ayah. The literal translation is presented, was presented last night and again tonight, that whoever follows a religion other than Islam, it will not be accepted. And God uses the word khasirin as he has used the word khasir al Kafaru, Khusran, or those who are at a loss. The most famous, Wala Asr, in the Linsana Lafi, Khusr, same word. So, with that understanding, question might arise. Does that mean Islam is condemning all the other religions? Does that mean Islam does not accept any other religion? Or then, follow-up would be, does that mean you and I, as Muslims, what are we to make of non-Muslims? All these questions are genuine. And they would come up if you took the ayat in the way that I translated for you. But that's the aspect of Arabic language where if it's not understood thoroughly, a mistake can be made. Quran has to be understood with all of its varieties in the words that are found. 
He said, well, we're not Arabs. We don't expect us to know the Arabic literature. So therefore, how is it that you can alternate the meaning of this word? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said easily, Whoever follows yattabe from ittaba, from following. But Allah instead said, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِ There's a difference. Not just a difference of the ba and the ta and the dots here and there. He uses a different word. But it also means the same. And there are words in English as well that are homonyms that are, you know, have the similar meaning but used for different things. And therefore, in Arabic, you have the same thing. Yabtaghe, how is it different from yattabe? Yattabe means follow, simple. Yabtaghe means slightly different. That when you are given the opportunity to follow the right thing and you deny it, that's what the word yabtaghe is giving you over here. Let me retranslate for, the, for you. Whoever follows a religion other than Islam after the thing had been made clear for them, which is the right path, it will not be accepted from him. And such an individual is considered to be a loser on the Day of Judgment. When you have already informed someone, there might be a person who stands up tomorrow and says, religion of Islam did not reach me. How is it my fault that I'm considered to be amongst the losers? You're not counted. You're not amongst them. For those who did not receive this message, what was the case with the Christians and the Jews of that time in Arabia when Rasulullah had brought the religion, explained to them, they should have been the first ones to say labbaik to Rasulullah. They should have been the first and foremost to embrace the religion, having had the knowledge from advance. They, in fact, knew that there would be a prophet coming afterwards whose name would be so-and-so, and it will complete the religion. But they declined and they denied it. And therefore, this ayat then makes sense. It is not blatantly saying anyone who is not a follower of the religion of Islam is bound to Jahannam. Rather, it's saying whoever follows the religion after they have been mentioned and explained and introduced to, it still falls and goes in the other direction. They are considered to be amongst the losers. The ayat continues, and I need to explain the ayat tonight so that the discussion could be easily understood later on. First word was yabtaghe, that I explained for you. Ghayr al-Islam, the word Islam is known to us. Many have addressed the word Islam in this ayat as well. That Islam does not necessarily mean the religion of Islam over here. Islam, in a broader sense, means what? Submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the ayat could be translated like this. Whoever adheres and follows a religion or follows something which does not where he does not submit to the will of Allah, he's encountered amongst the losers. Now that broadens the sphere and the spectrum a little bit, which includes a lot more people in it now. It's not, it's not limited to those who are Muslims. There are many people who submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're called muwahideen. They believe in the tawheed. Anyone who believes in Tawheed and submits to the will of Allah, they're called Muslim. Hazrat Ibrahim and Hazrat Ismail, alayhim salatu wasalam, what was the dua that they made? After Allah had ordered them to do what? Clean the house of Allah. Yes, in Surah Baqarah, Allah orders this father and son that oh, both of you, Ibrahim and Ismail, you two are responsible for cleaning the house of Allah. Tahira. Tahira from Taharat, from purification. You two are responsible for cleaning the house 
لل آکفین دو زدود اعتکاف دو زدود طواف اینڈ دو زدود رکا ان سجود رکو ان سجود سو ٹمارو ایف یو آر گیون دی اپرچونیٹی ٹو کلین دا ماسک ڈونٹ کنسیڈر دس ٹو بی دین وائی یو ٹیلنگ می ٹیل سم ون ایلس دس شوڈ بی کنسیڈرڈ این آنر فار یو دس شوڈ بی کنسیڈرڈ دیٹ از توفیق ٹو یو وائی یو آر ناؤ بینگ کاؤنٹیڈ آن دا سیم لائن ایز حبد ابراہیم این حضرت اسماعیل They were asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to clean the house. You're given this opportunity. And those who do it on the regular basis, here in this center and other centers, they're really, truly, those who are following the path of Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi wa sallam. Allah. Allah. You look at that. Quran is commanding them to clean the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You got this opportunity, you do it, you're on the path of Ibrahim and Ismail. But when that said, what was the dua Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam made? Rabbana, Rabba ja'alna muslimayn ilak. O Allah, make us muslimayn. There's no Islam at that time, right? The religion of Islam is introduced by our Prophet. Who will come some thousand of years later? Who are these? Ibrahim and Ismail are saying, what are they saying? Make us Muslim. Make us those who are submissive to your will, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So another meaning of the word Islam in this ayat could be submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I know those who have studied Quran and are well versed in Quran, you say, Mawlana, hold on a second. What about the ayat which says, in the deena, in the lahil, Islam. Deen in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nothing but Islam. So then over here, when it says Islam, it could mean the religion of Islam. Anyways, I presented all the possible meanings that could be used as far as the religion of Islam or the submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is concerned. Because if you look at the submission to the will of Allah, Many of us will exit the realm of Islam, right? How many times a day we disobey the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How many times do we neglect that wajib that is upon us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How many times we disobey by performing that haram which is made forbidden for us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So all those areas, every time you disobey, every time you neglect an instruction, right away, what are you doing? You're going against the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are you doing? You're exiting the realm of Islam. Submission is important. So towards the end of the ayah, it says what? غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا دِينًا What is this deen? Now, there's an entire debate on the word deen, which, of course, I will refrain from going into as it will take me away from my discussion and topic. Tonight, what I want to present to you is, after the explanation of deen, very quickly, five steps that is considered to be our duty as far as this deen is concerned. But we need to understand what this deen is. Maulana, you haven't explained deen properly to us. If I was to ask anyone over here what deen is, different people will give me different explanations. If you were to ask the scholar sitting on this member, I'm just a talib ilm, explain deen to us, they might even give you different things, but all pretty much the same in line. Different varieties will be given as far as what deen is. Someone would say, well, deen is what was brought by Rasulullah. Deen is what is found in Quran. Deen is what we look at in the hadith. Deen is salat and psalm. Deen is the name of all of these things. And you're right. These are all masadiq and the manifestations of deen. 
But what is Deen really? Deen is the name of three A's. Or I like to call it triple A. Not the company triple A. But easy acronym so you can remember what Deen is. To all the children sitting over here, this is for you. Deen is the name of three A's or triple A. First A stands for your aqaid beliefs. Second A stands for ahkam, the do's and the don'ts. And the third A stands for akhlaq, the morals and the ethics. You have all three of these, you have deen. Deen is the summary of these three A's. Aqaid encompasses everything as far as your beliefs are concerned. Tawheed, Nabuwat, Rasalat, Imamat, Qayamat, Adalat. I added Rasalat along with Nabuwat. Five of these are com- completed in their Aqidah. And then other Aqaid also. Then in Ahkam, you have all the do's and the don'ts. But if you have Aqaid and Ahkam, is that enough? No. Akhlaq are one of the most important things as part of this deen. Without these akhlaq, deen is incomplete. You can be the most knowledgeable of the people in usul and furu, but have the worst of the akhlaq. People will not come close to you. You know, one of the features of our prophet that was mentioned the Quran emphasizes a great deal. لَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيذَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ O Prophet, if you were stern-hearted, غَلِيذَ الْقَلْبِ They would have stranded you a long time ago. The reason they are still around you is because you're soft-hearted. It's not because you possess immense knowledge. There's no one more knowledgeable than Prophet. Even if all the Arabs know that at that time, Mushrikeen and Kuffar, that is not the reason they are holding on to Prophet. That is not the reason they considered him to be Amin and Sadiq, prior to him explaining the religion of Islam. They considered him Amin and Sadiq before he announced and propagated the religion of Islam. So how did he impress them? Not because of Islam. Not because of the teachings of Islam. Not because of the beautiful sayings. He attracted them through his akhlaq. Through his morals. And that is the reason when Prophet came, he said what? Innama bu'ithto li'utammima makarim al-akhlaq. You all know the word innama. How can a Shia not know a word innama? Innama yuridullah, right? Innama gives you hisar, meaning limits. Everything within is all that is there. Cannot be outside of it. Sort of like a fort, a castle. That's what innama is. He said, innama bu'ithto li'utammima makarim al-akhlaq. One of the reasons of my besat is not akhlaq. No, the reason. Of my basat is what? Akhlaq. It's to give you better akhlaq. It's to teach you akhlaq. It's to make you a better person. Change your character. And so when Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam al-Muttaqeen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, was asked, Wa salam wa salam. Imam said, La hayata illa bid-deen. There's no hayat. There's no life. Without deen. A life without deen is like a life spent by just breathing and eating and sleeping. Just like an animal. La hayata illa deen. There's no life without religion. mauta illa yaqeen. And there's no moth. You think moth is when someone closes their eyes? You call them dead? No. 
Death is when a person denies yaqeen. That's the person who's dead. When you deny yaqeen, the certainty, the reality, when you deny it, you're considered dead. Maut is what? Another name for maut is yaqeen. So where does that say that? Zahatta wa'abudu rabbaka hatta Yaqeen. Worship Allah until you get to certainty. What is the certainty? Some Sufis, Mutasawwafa, they thought that Yaqeen is the manazil and the marahil and the ranks of the orafa and the mystics. You attain those, you don't need to worship anymore. So they stop worshiping. They stop praying. These Darvesh and these Sufis, today's Sufis, there's no ibadat in their, in their practices. They have their own forms of ibadat. But of course, that is the tasawwuf and that is the Sufism which we don't expect or we don't accept. Islam declines, denies that. Don't get associated with that sort of Sufism. And that is prevalent in the world today. They thought if you get to a certain level, now you don't have to worship. You know? Ayat of Quran says that. Wa'abud rabbaka hatta. Worship Allah until you get to the yaqeen. I'm at the level of yaqeen now. I'm sitting at the place where it is certainty for me. Yeah? The word yaqeen over here does not mean certainty. The word yaqeen over here means mouth. Worship Allah until death comes upon you. Because the person who said, Law kushif al ghita mazdat tu yaqeenan, Amirul Mu'mineen said, If all the veils and the curtains are lifted, it will not increase one bit in my certainty. It will not increase one bit in my yaqeen. It's someone who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until his last breath. Ali was killed in Mihrab. Ali was struck in Mihrab while he was doing ibadat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He considers this ibadat to be a means of pride for him. How many times have you heard this call, beautiful call of Ali ibn Abi Talib? That every time you repeat this, I get goosebumps. Imam said, Ilahi, kafa bi fakharan, an takun ali rabban, wa kafa bi izzan, an akun laka abdan. Oh Allah, it is enough for my pride that you are my Rabb. I take pride in the fact that you are my Rabb. And it is enough for my azamat, wa kafa bi izzan. And my honor and my izzat, an akuna laka abdan, that I am your abd. That it is an honor for me that I'm your abd. It's a means of honor for Ali to be the abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Servitude to Allah is what is being asked over here. And then Ali topped it off with this sentence. Anta kama uhib, faja'alni kama tuhib. You are how I want my Rabb to be. Make me how you want me to be. Allah That should be a dua every night. You should make this dua before going to bed every night. Oh Allah, you are how I want you to be. Make me how you want me to be. So worship and ibadat is what is being meant over here. When Allah says, وَعَبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَاتِيكَ الْيَقِينَ Yaqeen means what? Maut over here. Some people start worshipping. You know, Ayatul Qarati, he gave an example. He said, when you climb on the roof, what do you need to climb? 
a ladder. Usually we climb with a ladder. You need a ladder to climb onto the, on top of the roof. When you've reached the top of the roof, what do you do? Do you push the ladder away? No, you're going to come down. So you need the ladder. If you've reached the highest of the maqam, doing the ibadat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't push this ladder away. Keep this ladder with you. This is in the form of this salat. You need it even after you have reached that maqam. And that is something which we found in the lives of Masumin. So Imam said, life without religion is no life. And life by denying the certainty is actually mouth. You and I need to kill, and I'm using it in a loose way, my language, and you know, forgive me for using this word, that may not come out right. We need to kill our souls before death comes upon us. And that is the kalam of Rasulullah. He said, Mutu qabla anta mutu. Die before death comes upon you. Now, how does that happen? How am I going to die before death comes upon me? Death is not even in my hands. Allah controls my death. Die, before, Rasulullah said, before death comes upon you. How does that happen? He said, means when death comes upon you, you see everything. You get to the level of certainty, yaqeen. Right? When death happens, your eyes are open. Although you're closing the eyes of the deceased, but the eyes are wide open. The dead person can see everything now. Everything becomes a reality for them. Rasulullah says, die before death comes upon you. Reach that level before death comes upon you. Surah Takathur, middle part of Surah Takathur, where it says, لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمُ That they will indeed see Jahim. What is Jahim? Jahim is Jahannam. Another name for Jahannam. لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمُ Who will see Jahannam? Those who have died, in Qiyamah, everybody will see Jahannam. You will see Jahannam, I will see Jahannam, all of us will see Jahannam. Anbiya will see Jahannam, Aima will see Jahannam, they will see it. Even those who are bound to Jannah, they will see Jahannam. Is there really a skill seeing the Jahannam in Qiyamah? Is it really a skill? No, if anything, you don't want to see the Jahannam. لَتَرَوُنَّ jahim means seeing Jahannam right here. In this life. Now someone might joke that Mawlana, my life is Jahannam. What are you talking about? I have seen that Jahannam that you're referring to. The difficulties that have surrounded me. No, we're not talking about that. Seeing the Jahannam in this life keeps you on your guard and your mm, vigil every step of the way. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So, what is deen? The kids remember? Triple A, right? Aqaid, Ahkam, and Akhlaq. These three are everything that you need as far as deen is concerned. You have these three, meaning you have the entire deen. Now, question arises that what is my duty towards this deen? This deen has to be important. Deen has to be something which is vital. Have we established that fact yet? Yes. According to the Rawayat of Imam, there's no life without Deen. So Deen is highly important. I'll give you another example to highlight how important this Deen is. I narrated three Rawayat for you last yesterday. You know, the time is going so fast. Imam Hussain, Rasulullah had said, is from me and I am from him. For Imam Hussain, Rasulullah had said, is the beacon of light and the ark of salvation. Another hadith says, Man ahabba Husaynan, faqad ahabba Allah. Whoever loves Hussain indeed, loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
ان الحسن اول حسین سیدا شباب اہل جنہ حسن حسین اور دی شباب اف اہل جنہ آل اف دیز روایات اینڈ مینی مینی مور ور دے سجیسٹ در امام حسین از سم ون امپورٹنٹ ڈو شی از ریلی نو ٹو نو ہو امام حسین از ہو از حسین ہو از حسین از از جماعت وچ از آلسو پرزینٹس اینڈ explains and introduces Imam Hussain to the world. Who is Hussain? Do we really need to know? We come to this majlis. We're all Husseini, so we know Hussain. But what does it mean to know Imam Hussain? Is it that Imam was born on 3rd of Shaban, in the third year after Hijrah? Imam was martyred on the 10th of Muharram, in the 61st year after Hijrah? Imam is the son of Ali and Fatima. Imam is the son, grandson of Rasulullah and Khadija. Imam's father, Imam's mother, Imam's sons, Imam's daughters. Is that the marifat of Imam? If that is the level of marifat of Imam, then I'm sorry to say Shimr is a better mu'min than you and I are. Umar Asad has more knowledge of Imam Hussain than you and I do. All of these characters of Karbala, Shimr, Umar Asad, and others, they have better understanding and knowledge of Imam Hussain. They've seen Imam Hussain in person. They've lived side by side Imam Hussain. They know Imam Hussain better than you and I. Because they were together. But do they have the ma'arifat of Imam Hussain? No, they don't. They didn't have the ma'arifat of Imam Hussain. That is the reason they drew their swords against him. No matter how much Imam tried. So that ma'arifat of Hussain, do we not know the maqam of Imam Hussain? We do. When the maqam of Imam Hussain is established for you, that Hussain is up there, and I don't have time to get in the further explanation of what Hussain is. Maybe a few minutes extra if I can take from your time. Imam Hussain is someone who did ibadat which is superior to the ibadat of Rasulullah. Imam Hussain showed generosity which is superior to the generosity of Imam Hassan. Imam Hussain showed bravery and valor which is superior to the bravery of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You say, well, that's a big claim. You know, when a child is born in a family which is already very affluent, it's very difficult for the child to be considered generous Because no matter how much he gives, people will always say, MashaAllah, they have so much and they're giving this much. If a millionaire gives a hundred dollars, or how the Jamaat is asking for three hundred, three hundred dollars, like, you're a millionaire and you're giving three hundred. That will always be the case. But if someone who lives hand to mouth makes three hundred dollars a week, for example, and it still gives 300, that'll be appreciated. MashaAllah. Another example. If someone is born in a house where no one has studied beyond high school and goes through the college and graduates, makes a name for himself. But if someone is born in a household where they're all PhDs and masters, it'll be very difficult for him to make his name. He'll have to do something really extraordinary to make a name for himself. So in a dark house, single bulb and the light can make an impact. But even in this hall where all these lights are illuminated, if I turn on the light of my camera and my phone, 
you won't even notice it. Why? The place is already illuminated. If the place was all dark, it was pitch dark in here, then my camera light would make an impact. See where I'm getting? So if you grow up in a house where there's everyone generous, you really got to hit it the way so that you make an impact and being considered a generous person. If you're born in a house where everyone is an alim, you really got to do some effort to make a name for yourself and be considered an alim. If you're born in a house where everywhere is shaja'at and bravery, you got to do something to really make an impact to be considered brave and shaja. Hussein is not born in a house which is illiterate. He's born in a house which has the seal of Anbiya. Sayyidul Mursaleen, Khatamul Anbiya, the one who possesses the knowledge of all. He has to do something to top that. Imam is born in a house where there's someone who's Madinatul Ilm. He's got to do something to make an impact above and beyond Ali. Imam is born in a house where you have a warrior and a brave like Ali ibn Abi Talib like no one has ever seen. Has to do something as far as his jihad is concerned which is above Ali ibn Abi Talib. And similarly generosity and other things. Do you get the point who Hussein is? Imam Hussein's one sajda one sajda is better, not better, it's above the ibadat of everyone. The shire said that. I didn't say this. What did the shire say? I'm very bad at poetry and remembering the poetry. Islam ke daman mein bas iske sewa kya hai? Ek zarbe yadullahi ek sajdae shabbiri. Islam ke daman mein. As far as Islam is concerned, there aren't many things. There are only two things. There's nothing more. Daman is this. This is what you call your daman, right? Your shirt's front part is called your daman. What is in the daman of Islam? Except zarbe yadullahi, that zarbat that was struck by Ali was sajda shabbiri. And the sajda done by Shabbir, Imam Hussain. Allahumma salam. That's it. Allahumma salam. That's why the Shabiri, when his shire said that, nobody objected to him saying, what, you limited the entire ibadat of everyone and then you compared it with the sajda of Imam Hussain? Yes, that's how important the sajda of Imam Hussain was. Right? That he prostrated at a time in a place when the swords are drawn towards him. When people are shooting arrows towards him. That one sajda of Sayyidul Shuhada in the plains of Karbala is above and beyond the ibadat of everyone. As far as the shuja'at is concerned, how can Hussein be, you know, top the shuja'at of Ali? Ali is someone who's shown the ma'arika in Badr and Khaybar and Hudayn and Khandak and so on and so forth. I don't have time to explain all of these battles. But Imam Hussein, whose jihad is above the jihad of Ali. How so? Whenever Ali would go to the battlefield, <laughs> Rasulullah would be bidding him farewell. On his right side would be Jibreel. On the left side, Mikail. From behind, Rasulullah. And when Ali would go to the battlefield, it's not when he has already given the shahadat of 72 of his companions and family members. But that's the difference between Hussein and Ali. When Hussein went into the maqtal, he had already picked up the bodies of 72 shuhada. Amongst them was his children and the companions. 
With all that, Hussein walks into the battlefield. Now you understand the shaja'at of Imam Hussein. All this was brought for one reason. Now you know who Hussein is. And I'll explain further tomorrow. Because I didn't do justice with this. Now you know who Hussein is. When you know who Hussein is, if Hussein stands up for something, isn't that really worth something? If someone famous endorses a product today, do we not rush to buy it? If someone famous shows you something, do we not all want to get that? That's how advertisement works. Imam Hussein presented this deen to us. Imam Hussein not only presented, sacrificed himself for this deen. So when someone is willing to go all the way to sacrifice themselves for something, do you think that thing is not worth something? And that too Hussein, who just explained who Hussein is. Not an ordinary individual. When Imam Hussein is sacrificing himself for this deen, then you know what this deen is. So make sure that we take care of this deen. It's not just the duty of those who sit on this member. It's the duty of every single individual. I didn't get to those five points. Inshallah, I'll bring it to you tomorrow. So that I can keep your interest in these lectures. That some tashnagi for tomorrow. Those five points that are our duties. But tonight I wanted to talk about someone who gave everything for the sake of steam. That is the first martyr of, for, of Karbala. You know who that first martyr of Karbala is? Muslim ibn Aqil. Muslim is the first one to give his shahadat in the way of Imam Hussein. Muslim is the ambassador of Sayyid al-Shuhada. Someone who's representing Imam Hussein. When the Kufans had written all these letters to Imam, Imam wanted to verify. So Imam sends his most confidant, the most trustworthy person to Karbala, to Kufa. And that is Muslim ibn Aqil. Imam writes a letter to the people of Kufa that the one who's coming to you is thiqati, mean I trust him. If I trust him, you should trust him as well. Muslim ibn Aqil arrives in Kufa, carries the duties of an ambassador, but only with the trickery and the cunning nature of Ibn Ziyad, those 18,000 people who had paid allegiance on the hands of Muslim, on the night when he offered Salat al-Maghrib and Isha, he turns around and he sees that only a handful were there. And then when he finishes Salat al-Isha, he sees that there is nobody behind him. Kufans had left. Kufan had betrayed Imam Ali. They had betrayed Imam Hassan. And now they're ready to betray Imam Hussein. But before they betray Hussein, they have betrayed the ambassador of Imam Hussein. Muslim is now wandering around in the streets of Kufa. He goes and he stands at a place and sits down. This lady comes out. Her name is Ta'a. She says, uh, that go to your house. Don't sit in front of my house. Uh, Muslim says, I don't have a house. Uh, she says, how is it possible that you don't have a house? Uh, he says that I'm a stranger in this land. Uh, he says, where are you from? Uh, he says, I'm from Medina. Now the lady is interested in knowing uh, where in Medina are you from? Uh, who is your family? <laughs> Muslim explains one after another that I am Muslim, son of Aqil, son of Ali, Ibn Abi Talib. I am the, I am the ambassador of Hussein. The moment she hears that, uh, she said, you are my imam's guest. That means you are my guest as well. And she invites him into the house. Uh, you can spend the night here. 
Nobody will touch you. Muslim spends the entire night doing the ibadat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when the son of this lady finds out the man that he was looking for all around Kufa is hiding in his house, he informs Ibn Ziyad, who sends an army to go ahead and tackle Muslim Ibn Aqil. He wanted to safeguard the sanctity of this house. He comes out to fight. He fights till the last breath uh, to the extent uh, that the person who was sent to bring Muslim in uh, asked Ibn Ziyad for more people saying I cannot control this one man. Ibn Ziyad said I sent you to go ahead and capture one man. You need more army. He says yes uh, you did not send us to capture someone uh, who was an ordinary individual. This is Muslim Ibn Aqil. He attacks like a warrior, like a lion comes from the lineage and the progeny of those who were warriors themselves. Muslim was then given aman, sanctuary, he was given the security and immunity and he was tricked into following this and he gave up. Once Muslim was arrested, he was brought to Darul Amara. Ibn Ziyad, Ibn Ziyad, in la'anatullah alayhi, he speaks Speaks to him, Muslim Ibn Aqil. Muslim says, uh, and there are three things that I want you to carry out. Uh, number one. Number one, I'm Makruz. I'm in debt, sell my shield and my sword to pay off my debts. Number two, Muslim Ibn Aqil requests. One of the requests that he had was that send my message to Hussein. I had written a letter to him. Come to Kufa as soon as possible. But now tell him not to come to Kufa. Muslim's request was denied. Uh, when it was denied, it was ordered that his body be thrown from top of Darul Amara. Muslim's body was thrown after he was beheaded. Uh, but before he was beheaded, uh, he sent his salam to his Aqa Hussein. Assalamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah. As if when he sent his salam, Hussein heard it. Uh, Hussein was still far away on his way to Karbala. He hears the sound and the voice of Muslim. He says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. He comes inside the tent. He calls the daughter of Muslim. When the daughter of Muslim comes, Imam places his hand on the head of the daughter of Muslim. She says, Oh, uncle, you are true treating me like they treat the orphans. Hussein said, oh my daughter, indeed tonight you have become an orphan. But don't worry, as long as Hussein is alive, nobody will treat, mistreat you. I said, oh Hussein, after the death of Muslim, you took care of the yatim of Muslim. But tomorrow when you will be killed, who will will treat Sakina in this way. Ala ala anatullah al-qawm al-zalimeen. Wa sayyalamu al-lazina zalamu ayyamun qalibin yan qalibun. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raju'oon. Oh Allah, please accept our ibadah tonight. Oh Allah, we've committed a lot of sins. Please forgive our sins. Oh Allah, give us the tawfiq and ability to follow the commands and the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt alayhi wa sallatu wa salam. Oh Allah, haste in the reappearance of our way to the Imam. Make us amongst the helpers and the soldiers of Imam Al-Akhru Da'arana. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Ma'atabin Hussain.